Okay, welcome back. Um, it's day 37, I believe, of the Russian-Ukrainian war. And what's that old saying? Um, it never goes as you planned. And we have no greater example of that in history than the Peloponnesian War, of course, when um, Pericles decided to hole up in Athens and um, avoid contact with the land army of the Spartans, or the Peloponnesian army, I guess I should say, and decided to keep the war at sea, which, of course, was Athens' main strength. Of course, it didn't go to plan, and that is one of the great examples in history. Of course, a plague broke out in Athens, and next thing you know, large amounts of Athenian soldiers were dying. So that's just one of the great examples where you can have a great plan, everything can look great, and it doesn't go exactly the way you think it does. And I think every general, uh, no matter where, um, you know, even no matter what, uh, in history, no matter what part of history you're dealing with, they know, they all know that, that war does not go as according to uh, plan. In fact, Napoleon, I think, once said, um, he asked, what are the skills of a great commander? You have to be willing to I think he, I forget, you said you have to be willing to look this way, that way, that way, or that way, or change this, this, or that. That's the uh, a great commander. You have to be willing to adapt. That's effectively what he was saying. But that's what we're kind of seeing here. Uh, the Ukrainians have put up uh, an unbelievable resistance. I mean, before the war, in the weeks prior to the war, uh, I can't tell you how many articles I read on both sides, basically, it said that this war would be over in a couple weeks, maybe in a, even in a few days. You know, the, the Russian tanks would, would pull into Kiev and that would be it. They would be able to install a puppet government. But that hasn't happened. The Ukrainians are fighting on and on and on. And if you read some of the reports now, uh, it almost looks like uh, the, the Ukrainians have pushed back and taken back some of these towns. That's one of the things I wanted to talk about, though. Um, what I find really interesting, and I don't remember, I'm, I'm 52 now, and I don't remember so many, I mean, I wasn't alive during Vietnam. And, I mean, I was alive at the end of it, but I not enough to remember it. But I don't remember where you had so many just... 180 degree different reports. I'm talking, uh, you read one day that Ukraine uh, is about to lose, they're out of ammunition, that's going to be it, right, in, in a week. And then you read another one that says, nope, the Russians are going to lose this, they're retreating, and it's game over for the Russians. So it's just really interesting all the different perspectives you're getting, and you don't know what to believe. But I think you can kind of say, if you take a look at it, it does sort of appear that Russia has repositioned uh, their troops and is focusing in on the Donbass region and uh, wants to at least take control of that and, and make sure those regions are autonomous and basically report directly to Russia. Um, but it also does appear that they've sort of um, entrenched some of their positions or I, I, this is around the Kiev area. Or have, and I still call it Kiev, by the way. I can't, I know they're using the, the correct pronunciation, Kiev, but I, I still have to call it Kiev. And I, I, I guess I watched too many World War II films where in those days they were calling it Kiev. But in any, in any event, uh, they've uh, retreated back into parts of Belarus and are uh, retooling their armies to come back for another counteroffensive. So it's difficult to see what exactly is happening. There was one really big event a few days ago, though, that I thought was a real game changer. And again, we're getting different perspectives on this, but it, it does appear that the Ukrainians launched uh, an attack on an oil depot in Russia. And if that's true, that would be a huge, huge escalation and a huge game changer. The fact that Ukrainian... I mean, it's always interesting that if you can send a message to your enemy that, hey, we can attack you in your borders, that can really alter your line of thinking really quickly. The uh, Americans did that, by the way, in the Pacific War against the Japanese. They launched the Jimmy Doolittle attack on, on uh, the raid on Tokyo. They firebombed Tokyo. And of course, that was a basically a, some, uh, a symbolic message to say, hey, we can attack you, but you can't attack us. That was the whole point of that psychological warfare. And that's probably why the Ukrainians did this. They wanted to show the Russians, by the way, we can strike inside your, your territory anytime we want to. 
And that could have uh, an impact perhaps on the peace negotiations. If Putin knows that, you know, they could disrupt, you know, Russian supply lines, that could have a huge impact. We'll see. And that's the other thing we don't know right now. I mean, all the reports are, you know, the Russians want peace. No, they don't want peace. Um, there's reports that Putin now just wants to get those two provinces out east and then he'll he'll secure a peace deal with the Ukrainians. Other reports say, no, Putin's going to basically wipe the whole country off the map and doesn't care. So, again, we'll have to wait and see. We just really don't know. There you, again, you see all of these different perspectives, different articles saying different things. So it's really hard to gauge what's going on. And I guess most wars are like that. In the end, uh, nobody will remember what they fought the war over. Or if they do remember, they'll be like, why did we fight this war? I think that probably happens in 95% of the wars. Why did we even fight this war? And I think they'll be saying that, especially if they do get a peace deal where Ukraine declares neutrality. Uh, they're allowed to join the EU. Uh, Russia gets control of those two provinces. And that's kind of what the talk was before this war even started. So a lot of people are going to go, well, why did we even fight this war in the first place? Now, one other aspect I want to talk about is this business of mercenaries. Now, there's been a lot of articles saying that the Russians have opened up some recruitment centers inside Syria, and they are vetting candidates. Obviously, if you are a professional soldier or were in the Syrian army, you're put at the very top of the list and basically paying mercenaries to fight some of these urban battles, which apparently the Russians have a distaste for. And uh, one of the commentators said, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe Russia would do this. And I was really surprised by that comment. I wanted to actually call into that commentator and go, that's as old as time. Hiring out mercenaries, that's nothing new. I mean, how could he even say that? I mean, apparently he doesn't know history because that goes back almost to, the, to recorded history. And it, there's no better example of that. Again, I always like to go back to the Peloponnesian War. Really, the Peloponnesian War is the fundamental war. You can compare the Peloponnesian War to almost anything that goes on today. If it's politics, strategy, tactics, it almost relates to anything that goes on today. It's, it's almost like a carbon copy of it. And so if you remember, if you watched my videos, you will remember that, um, yeah, the, Pel you know, the, the, the whole, well, let me back up. So the, the, the circumstances are always the same. You have a big war, the territory is devastated, and the soldiers no longer, I mean, basically it relates to jobs. They can't put food on the table. If you can't put food on the table and you have professional experience fighting in a war, well, and somebody wants to hire you out, there's always a war to find. That's usually not too hard on this planet. So uh, yeah, why not hire yourself out? And then you can take care of your family. It's risky, but it's risk reward, right? You're going to get paid big bucks to go into a hot zone and fight. And that's, of course, what happened in the Peloponnesian War. After the Peloponnesian War, the uh, areas were, were completely devastated, and you had, um, you had soldiers that were willing to hire themselves out. The Greeks, that became one of the primary occupations, to hire yourself out as a mercenary. And there were numerous examples of that. Perhaps one of the biggest was the March of the 10,000, when Clearchus put together an army of 10,000, and they went deep into the heart of the Persian Empire. Of course, Cyrus was fighting his brother Artaxerxes for control of the Persian throne, and he hired out a very, very formidable army, an army that they couldn't get rid of in Persia. No matter, even though it was severely outnumbered, they couldn't destroy it because this was, uh, these were fully professional soldiers. And uh, so that, that's nothing new. That's why I was kind of surprised by that comment, or anybody could be surprised by that. That's as old as time. Hiring out mercenaries to go fight your war. Gaddafi did it uh, just recently in Libya. I mean, there was, a, there was a big example of that. He was hiring out, uh, I, I forget the country. Was it the Congo? Somewhere. Somewhere he was bringing in soldiers. Anyways, thanks as always for watching. Uh, we'll see where this goes. I might do another one in a few weeks if there's a peace deal. Let's hope. Let's hope there's some peace here. And they can address the security concerns of everybody. I mean, that's really what they have to do. They have to address the security concerns of the Ukrainians, of the Polish, of the Russians. Everybody needs to have their security concerns Guaranteed, if they don't, I think we're going to be right back at this. And uh, who knows? It could get even worse. So we'll see. Let's just uh, let's all pray for peace. Okay. Thanks as always for watching.